focused on strategies for tackling inequality, and we felt it would be good in the final session um, if we focus particularly on what forms of policy or action or practice uh, might be uh, encouraged. Obviously, a lot of the earlier sessions have been analytical, but quite a few of those have moved on to thinking about uh, how we should try to change the world through policy or through social um, action. But this, uh, this session is very much focused upon what should be uh, done. It's um, sponsored by the Global Development Institute, and I think we just had our little one minute um, uh, film on there um, because we are celebrating our 60th birthday, and certainly one of the things that we uh, try to focus our students uh, on is that they need to analyze what's happening, but they also need to work out how we move forward or how we take action. To help us in this exercise this afternoon, we've got a, a great panel, and each of our panelists will be talking for 10 to 15 minutes um, at the start to talk about what forms of action they think are priority actions, what things could be done. We'll then pass it over to you as a plenary to give us short questions if you want, or short and very focused comments on what the priority should be, what forms of action should be taken forward. Um, if there's an opportunity, we'll give our panelists the chance to comment on those comments uh, once or twice, and at the end we'll give the panelists uh, two or three minutes each to see if they can set a direction, to see if there is some particular course of action that seems to be emerging from our conversation, um, or whether there are several courses of action and we'll have to do our own analysis to work out how we might uh, try to reduce inequality and uh, certainly uh, reduce many of the problems that we've been looking at over the last two and a half days. Um, <clears throat> On my left is uh, Sakiko Fukudapa, and we'll start the presentations off. Uh, most of you will know Sakiko, and you'll have had to have read her work over the years, I'm sure, but she is a professor of international affairs at the New School uh, in New York. She's a development economist, but she's a development economist who is unusual in that her work is focused very much upon human rights, upon issues which are often seen um, as not being central to economic analysis. Um, I'm not going to go through all the books you've published recently or, or, or over the years, but they are listed um, in, in the, uh, in, in, in the, uh, the programme for the event. But uh, you probably will also know her very well um, if you've read the Human Development Reports, because um, during 1995 and 2004, during the, the heyday of excellent Human Development Reports, then Sakiko was leading that office, and certainly there are a whole series of reports which, uh, yeah, Many of you, uh, like me, will have uh, had to uh, have, have, uh, have read. Um, after Sakiko, then we'll be moving over to Alex Cobham. Alex uh, is trained originally as an economist. He's chief executive of the Tax Justice Network and a visiting fellow at King's College uh, London. His work in particular focuses upon uh, illicit and illegal financial flows, how to get uh, effective taxation systems operating in developing countries, and on uh, inequality. And he's been uh, a researcher at Oxford University and also with a number of uh, think tanks and NGOs, Christian Aid, Save the Children Fund, and the Centre for Global Development uh, in Washington, D.C. Last but not least um, is Dorcas Erskine. Dorcas has been very kind to us because unfortunately uh, Lily uh, Nesbill couldn't make it uh, today and we've uh, we managed to get uh, Dorcas to, to come. She is the Director of Policy, Advocacy and Programs at ActionAid, where she oversees the organization's development and humanitarian work. Um, she is a specialist at working on gender-based violence and working in difficult uh, humanitarian uh, situations uh, and also worked extensively on human trafficking. Uh, that's included Myanmar, the Balkans, the Caucasus, Iraq, Afghanistan uh, and Tanzania. She's also uh, worked in the UK Parliament and worked in the, in the corporate uh, uh, sector before she uh, moved into working with non-profits. Okay, so to start off with, we've got some things for you to think about from this panel, but if you're thinking, if you have a question or if you have a comment, then do please put it down. But we don't want lectures to come, we'd, we'd like you to give us focused comments, so do think about that. Sakiko, can we let you start? Thank you very much for this uh, invitation and thank you all for being here on this 
sunny afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk about the SDGs as and how we should all be dealing with the SDGs, um, and particularly about the perils of taking the framework too literally. I think for uh, anybody else, anybody who was engaged with the debates about setting the SDGs in, that took place uh, for nearly three years, I think 2011 to 2014, um, the fact that there's an inequality goal is definitely a huge victory. This was very controversial, there was a lot of opposition to having a standalone goal, uh, but it's there, and moreover, the whole sort of rallying cry of the entire 2030 agenda is to leave no one behind. So this looks like an extremely strong commitment, and it is, in fact, you know, entrenched in this declaration <coughs> as a very strong normative commitment to reduce inequality within and between countries. But when you start looking at the actual framework and the way that the targets and indicators have been developed, you realize that there's something very strange, which is that there is not a single indicator or a target that refers to the distribution of income or wealth. I mean, most of us have been reading many, many articles, and here, of course, we have had every day, every hour, every session, some reference to inequality. The keynote speeches have all been about inequality, and there's been plenty of references to the measurement tools. Um, and, of course, things like the Gini coefficient, and we had, of course, Gabriel Palma, uh, and his uh, Palma index uh, is, is obviously uh, very much at the forefront of the way that inequality is being measured. So uh, it is rather strange that out of 10 targets and 11 indicators, there is not a single uh, uh, one that is on the distribution of income and wealth and, and commonly widely used uh, measurement like the Gini. Whether you like it or not, nonetheless, it is accepted as a standard, uh, is not there. And then when, when you look further at the targets and indicators, you realize that much of the focus is on combating group-based discrimination and not about uh, economic uh, inequality. Uh, and in fact, the, the most important indicator, in fact, this is because of you know, the, the, the target one and target and indicator one, is by 2030, progressively achieve and sustain income growth of the bottom 40% of the population at a rate higher than the national average. This is actually not a distributional uh, indicator of measurement, but it is an indicator of shared prosperity. This is the flagship objective of the World Bank. Why should we be caring about this? And, and it's because the way that these um, these targets and indicators have been selected um, and defined, frame the debates. So go global goals are apparently a statement of valuable objectives and priorities. They're political objectives. But what, how they work politically is that they frame discourse. They have a very important, they are powerful because they have uh, they have a discursive effects on framing and discourse. And they are used by already powerful actors to further enhance their power, <coughs> and particularly hegemonic power. And the real purpose is not <coughs> to focus on an important issue, but actually to contain the debate and to keep out inconvenient issues that they don't like. So the the, the way that framing works, and there are books written about this, the way that framing works is to create a narrative, to define a problem in a particular way, which then suggests that there are certain strategies for combating that problem. Um, and so those things sound like sort of obvious thing to do, but then what is outside the framework just sort of looks irrelevant and unthinkable. And so what the, what the way, the choice of the measurement tool, the choice of the target, um, actually redefine that value norm, the, the, the normative goal of reducing inequality 
as shared prosperity. Of course, inequality can be interpreted in many different ways, but interpreting it as shared prosperity has important implications in terms of policy. It means that you're essentially concerned with exclusion and poverty, not with distribution. And, but that is not the only way in which political debates about inequality have proceeded. Much of the concern with inequality in our day is about extreme <coughs> inequality, which is a problem of the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of the elite. And so there is a very clear strategy involved in that choice of indicator and target, the choice of the me measurement tool. Um, and so we know from, I mean, you know, Alex knows this much better than I, I do. He's written a lot of uh, papers on this. But shared prosperity is a measure that essentially focuses on the bottom of the distribution and, and is basically a poverty reduction measure. Whereas Gini coefficient is a measure that is most sensitive to changes in the middle, whereas the PARMA index is more sensitive to changes in the top and the bottom. Um, and so therefore, we choose a measurement indicator that is focused only on the bottom of the distribution and not, doesn't refer to the top. And so what is the politics that led to this outcome? This is not some sort of a benign, neutral choice. Uh, it was a deliberate choice, obviously. And, and it's because of the nature of the, the controversy over inequality within the SDG framework uh, during the process of negotiations. And there was one camp who was opposed to having too much inequality, in the, um, in, in, in the framework, they didn't want a standalone goal. Um, and on the other hand, uh, there was no question that inequality uh, would not be in the agenda because there was too much momentum in the run-up to these negotiations of opposition to the, and one of the biggest criticism of the MDGs was that it did not include an inequality agenda. There was also this massive concern with extreme inequality. I mean, this was things that are being discussed at the World Economic Forum, not only by Oxfam and other sort of NGOs, but by uh, captains of industry and finance, uh, by Christine Lagarde and so forth. Um, and then politically, the, the G77, sorry, there's a typo there, um, uh, had, had of course been pushing uh, inequality amongst countries as an important agenda. And furthermore, it was a core element of the Rio Plus 20 agenda, which was the basis for the SDGs. So the real discussion was about whether there should be a standalone goal or a theme embedded in all the other goals, whether extreme inequality was the issue or whether the concern should focus on the excluded, whether the concern should be on income and wealth or on human outcomes. <coughs> and so there were those who argued for inequality as something that was intrinsically important, and human right to equality. Um, there were arguments against that was made that was not against uh, a concern with inequality, but they argued that basically uh, inequality <coughs> was essentially the same as poverty. Uh, and so, you know, I don't want to go through all of this, but if you actually look at the different documents and who said what, you will find that there was a fairly strong momentum of those who did not want to have inequality as a highlighted standalone goal, and that was in the whole post-2015 <coughs> process and the high-level panel of eminent persons chaired by, co-chaired by David Cameron. Uh, and, and sort of the, I, the thinking there was, you know, what you need to do is to go to zero, eliminate all poverty, uh, then you would get rid of all inequality. That was sort of the argument. Whereas there were others who argued for a, a much more robust inequality uh, goal, and, and they were mostly, to, you know, the, the, the major groups. But the problem was that there, were, there was not that much uh, traction for this because um, there weren't many champions, I would say, 
so the goal 10 was kind of in, a, in, in the zero drop and out again and in again and out again. Ultimately, it prevailed. Um, so, but somewhere along all of this debate, I think, you know, that the World Bank, it must have been, at least because it was their indicator, inserted this, uh, this target of um, uh, the income growth of the, of the bottom 40%. And, and so the, the, when I interviewed people about how this all happened and the negotiations, there were comments like, oh yes, well, you know, the target got defined by the measure, you know. And then there were others who said, oh, well, yes, no, we didn't want to discuss the, the, these, these issues like the Palmer Index and Gini. It was just too technical. Um, and then by the time it got to the statisticians who were supposed to choose the indicator, they said, well, you know, we couldn't do anything because uh, obviously the target had been defined by the, group, the shared prosperity indicator. And this statement by the UK delegation, I think, uh, in the, at the height of the negotiations over this goal, I think sort of says it all about the position that was taken by those who are trying to get key inequality agenda out. You know, we've already spoken about the value in the target of reducing number of people living in poverty uh, below national poverty floors, which is a critical, which is a critical vehicle to shrink inequality. We also are attracted by the proposal about requiring that any target will not be considered met unless it is met for the lowest quintile of any given population. Once again, emphasis on poverty. We are less convinced by the standard run goal on inequality. This could lead us to a sterile debate that economists have been having for generations and that we are unlikely to resolve here. We see much greater practical potential and con concrete impact in addressing inequality through goals and targets related to poverty eradication, equal access to productive and other assets, social protection flaws, gender equality, elimination of discriminatory practices, policies and laws, and job and a job rich and inclusive growth. So inequality would be redundant as a goal. So um, I mean I, I think that what we have to realize then is that the SDG framework apparently has an inequality goal, but the framework of targets and indicators that are supposed to be sort of the operational mechanisms for developing an action strategy actually eliminates distributional questions and eliminates the issue of inequality of <coughs> income and wealth and extreme inequality, the concentration of power and wealth in the hands of the elite. And so, I mean, I think that this, uh, this is important basically because uh, it is not an issue just for inequality, but the way that we have let the whole international development agenda be totally dominated <coughs> by the language of numbers. Interpreting the language of words into numbers takes you on this slippery slope <coughs> of reinterpreting these important social and polit political objectives into something that you perhaps did not mean it to be. And so, you know, there's a, there's a big literature on uh, governance by indicators and the effects of indicators. It's a long-standing uh, uh, literature in the field of sociology of knowledge. And they all argue that numbers, governance by numbers is basically a strategy of states and now here, this has been used in the international domain. And, you know, the numbers are used to sort of organize and also to interpret uh, and reinterpret concepts. So I think what it also means that is, is that for us, we have to be aware there's a kind of a hidden politics of numbers. That, this is a conclusion, that the, um, um, that indicators actually are not neutral in the way that we are told to believe that they are. Indicators actually embed theories of social change, theories about economic development, theories about development. And so 
institutionally, we have arranged things so that choices about metrics are relegated to these te technical actors. But in fact, they have become sites of political contestation, and some of the actors are very well aware of this, and others are not, and others are very badly prepared to, to uh, operate in that site. Um, so, I think what we really need to think about is whether global goal setting is a good way to develop, to find a development agenda, how we should use these <coughs> indicators and targets, and perhaps to quote something that David and I already quoted in our joint paper about the MDGs, we quoted uh, Claire Short, remember her, saying MDGs, take them seriously, but not literally. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mr. Kiko. So SDG 10, a, a great, uh, a huge success, but a great disappointment at the same time. We're now going to move on to Alex, who's going to focus particularly on tax justice. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm struck by uh, following Sakiko. Well, no one can follow Sakiko, but um, that in some ways, although I absolutely share everything that you've just said, I'm going to make a different argument about the SDGs now, or at least about one particular target. The um, I'm, I'm put in mind of Joan Robinson saying the reason to learn economics is not so that you can solve economic problems, but so that you don't get fooled by economists. <laughs> for, a, for a similar reason, people who care about politics need to learn and engage with the technical questions around measurement, so we don't get shut down in just the way that Sakiko's um, described so clearly. And there's currently a very live process uh, where this is highly relevant. Um, insert here obligatory um, uh, statement about how awesome the tax justice network is uh, and move quickly on. Okay. Um, what, I, what I'm going to talk through quickly is why tax, why do you care about this, and then how big uh, the problem of tax injustice is, in other words, why uh, we exist, and then the opportunities, um, and one in particular around SDG 16.4. Um, David told me to be quick, so I didn't tell him I have two slides per minute um, <laughs> bear with me. Um, all right, uh, why do we tax? We tax for the four R's, okay? The first of which, the one everyone thinks of, is revenue, okay? Clearly very important. Um, fundamental to the delivery uh, of the SDGs, and indeed fundamental to a great many things beyond the SDGs that we care about, but not uh, well distributed globally. Um, this data from uh, a relatively new data set, the ICTD wider government revenue database, which I recommend um, uh, biasedly as the best source of global revenue data. The pattern it shows is pretty striking. The dark green there is um, tax to GDP above 40%, light green is 30 to 40%, uh, yellow 10 to 20%, and orange 10% or less. Um, this is not, uh, as you'll see, a, a randomly distributed uh, pattern uh, of revenues. A slightly more positive story, if we look at non-resource taxes in particular, and to, to strip out the effect of uh, resource revenues, we do see progress. The, uh, the green line at the bottom there is um, low-income countries. Pretty much, as with everyone else, fairly flat up until 2000. Um, in certain discussion of structural adjustment here, and then, uh, actually, through the period of the MDGs, uh, relatively sustained progress. This hides a lot of variation, but you know, low income and lower middle income, the orange lines, do show a common pattern with upper middle income, rather than it being uh, a divergence. So there is good news um, there, just not enough of it. Far too many countries, for example, still under the 15% uh, level for tax to GDP, which the IMF has historically used as a uh, kind of um, uh, a rule of thumb for state fragility. We might argue with that mechanistic approach, but that kind of level is telling you something about where the state can realistically hope to fund the um, uh, development aspirations of uh, people. Okay, the second R, redistribution. Um, uh, highly relevant here, obviously, without effective tax, we will not have effective redistribution. Revenues to fund um, uh, positive uh, redistribution, but also a tax system that delivers itself um, 
uh, a fairly high degree of progressive redistribution. Um, this is one example from a particular country in a particular year, but it's unfortunately echoed in many countries many years. So here are direct taxes in Brazil in the mid-2000s. Um, at the far end there, we have households with less than twice the minimum wage uh, as their income. At the other end, um, households with more than 30 times uh, the minimum wage as their income. Nice progressive uh, trend to this. Households at the bottom um, paying about 3% uh, of their income in direct taxes, going up to about 10% at the top end. Go Brazil. Okay, here are indirect taxes. Um, the pattern completely reversed and the numbers much higher. So almost half of the incomes of the poorest households being paid in indirect taxes falling to 16% uh, in the highest uh, income households. And of course, if we combine them, it's the second uh, one that dominates. And so overall, you can say Brazil at this point had a progressive direct tax system that wasn't doing a lot of work, completely dominated by a very regressive indirect tax system. Now, if you use the income you get from this for very progressive transfers, you can uh, cope with this effect overall. And the IMF uh, advice has always been to do that. Don't try and have direct taxes or be progressive there, do it on spending. While at the same time on the spending side, kind of encouraging you actually not to do it there either. Um, but you know, that's, that's kind of been the game for, for decades. The IMF research people at least are now saying that doesn't work. The country teams appear not to be hearing the, uh, the message. And so this is a challenge we face uh, with, with varying parameters in you know, a great many countries of the world, um, including, uh, for the record, this one. Um, the overall effect is that, um, just thinking as a, a single measure of, of what's going on there, direct or indirect um, tax revenue ratio has fallen. Um, and again, you can see structural adjustment here uh, pretty clearly for what the IMF calls emerging market economies, paralleling a process that's happened in uh, high income countries, but where of course you have a much higher level of revenue to allow you to compensate uh, on the distribution side. Okay, the other two others, um, repricing, I'm gonna skip over, but that's you know, important for taxes and allowing you to reprice things like tobacco or carbon um, that you may want to change uh, consumption or production of. Fourth, most often overlooked and probably most important, is representation. Um, it's not so much uh, the, the um, US uh, independence cry of no taxation without representation, but the evidence is the other way around. You don't get effective representation if you don't have an effective tax system. In particular, people paying direct taxes that they are aware of and annoyed about lead them to hold the government to account for what it's doing with the money and what it's doing more generally. And so the direct tax component is especially um, important there, uh, coming back to that. Um, well, actually, no, one thing. Think about the diagram of, of distribution of where taxes fall, direct taxes in particular. If your direct tax payment is related to your political engagement, then one thing you get with that type of tax system is that people on lower incomes are likely to be less politically engaged, not because of anything they're doing, but because of this tax effect. Now think, secondly, who is likely to be in low-income households? And it's pretty clear, if you think about any country context you're familiar with, that a, a whole set of more marginalized groups, whether that's ethnic linguistic groups or by gender, are gonna be overrepresented at the bottom end of that um, scale and underrepresented at the top end. So what is the inequality of political representation that the tax system is driving if it looks like those pictures? And as I say, more or less those pictures um, have some kind of parallel in pretty much every country where we have data. We need to understand, I think, the politics of that redistribution as being ultimately more important than the financial redistribution that is going on there, and think about how we challenge that in tax policy. Okay, um, scale of tax justice. This is the key point, this is why we exist, and, and this is what I'm arguing us uh, to do something about. There are massive global inequalities in taxing rights, the taxing rights that states are able to exert on income that their residents are making. Um, and that comes into channel one, profit shifting by multinational companies um, is particularly uh, large. This is data uh, estimates using an IMF methodology, but with our um, far superior data um, and slightly more conservative numbers. Overall, we've got an estimate of something like $500 billion a year in tax losses uh, from the profit shifting of multinationals. 
But as you can see, very concentrated in absolute terms in a, in a set of countries of which the US is the most important. Do we care about this for development? Well, we should. Um, as a percentage of total tax take, the, con the uh, concentration is, is quite the opposite. It's in low-income countries. And you have a set here of um, low-income countries where the impact of uh, the lost revenues and profit shifting are in excess of 10% of their current tax revenues. So we're talking potentially about a big step um, change if we can combat this uh, global problem. Uh, who wins? Well, you know, possibly nobody whose um, levels of uh, inequality we're too concerned about. Although it's worth thinking that in at least two of these countries, there are significant problems of poverty because following the tax haven model is also very bad for your own inequality. Um, so even with very high per capita income levels, you get people being left very far behind indeed. Uh, okay, the um, other piece is of course undeclared offshore, um, the more individual but some corporate also um, largely outright tax evasion rather than avoidance. Similar pattern here, um, and this is just some numbers from Alstad, Setter and Zuckman, that give you a sense of how much of the wealth of the top 0.01% um, is offshore in different countries. Um, the reason the US is so small is of course because US states compete to provide financial <coughs> secrecy, and so the US is largely its own offshore um, uh, jurisdiction. Okay, um, three things come from that. Global inequality in terms of the ability to raise revenues, and especially to raise revenues on direct taxes, which are likely to have this more important political effect. Global inequality in the space to carry out redistribution, if you can't tax top incomes and corporate profits, very difficult to get redistribution on the tax side, even if you're um, not thinking about doing redistribution on the revenue side. Ultimately, this is a global inequality in sovereignty. Lower income countries are locked out of the positive process of taxing their citizens and strengthening their political representation. And over time, that gives rise to all the things that, in a sense, aid donors were saying were the reasons that the MDGs weren't uh, achieved, partly a lack of tax revenue in countries, but also problems that we've historically put under the hat of corruption and said we're a lower income country problem, rather than thinking that this is a financial secrecy problem in which the main players are high income <coughs> jurisdictions. Okay, uh, some answers with two new letters. Um, the, uh, when Tax Justice Network was set up 15 years ago, um, and the first uh, couple of years we put in place a policy platform that we call the ABC of Tax Transparency. There is now a DEF gene, but I'm going to spare you most of that. Um, that ABC, we were told at the time, you know, that it's ridiculous, nobody will take this seriously, it's, uh, you know, if it even makes sense, it's completely um, utopian. It is now the global policy agenda, and being delivered to a certain extent, albeit in a way that still doesn't fully include lower income countries. So A is the automatic exchange of tax information, effectively the end of Swiss bank secrecy, a requirement that a country like Switzerland, the financial institutions need to declare the information uh, in a multilateral instrument to other countries about what their residents are holding in Swiss banks, and similarly for more than 100 jurisdictions now. Um, beneficial ownership transparency, that's public registers of the, the real warm-blooded human owners of companies, trusts, and foundations now just about in place across the European Union. The UK Parliament's just required it for the overseas territories, for companies, um, and increasingly becoming the international standard. And C, country by country reporting, the requirement that multinationals must put in the public domain data on where their economic activity is and where their profits are declared uh, and taxes paid in order to show clearly if there is a misalignment um, between these, with a global consensus that that misalignment should be reduced. Uh, and you know, one proposal, and we're working on it many, the G is a global convention to try and lock this stuff in, in a way to make sure lower income countries are fully included, not just OECD members who are disproportionately benefiting at the moment. Okay, in terms of the SDGs, I'm just going to go to 16.4. We have 17.1 establishing tax as an important um, means of implementation, definite progress from the MDGs, in terms of norm setting rather than there being any uh, very uh, powerful um, policy tools in there. Um, and 10 and elsewhere are focused on inequalities, where I would say the key thing is not targets that get hit, 
but the potential to create a data framework so that the legacy won't be how much more progress we've made. It will be that we actually understand the nature of a whole set of inequalities that we really didn't during the MDGs, either because we didn't care or because we thought that was a bit technical. And to some extent, at least that dynamic has, has been shifted. But 16.4 is what I want to talk about. This is one of those targets that is called uh, Tier 3, which means effectively nobody knows what they're doing with it, and there's a possibility it never gets uh, as indicators properly created. Um, and indeed, those who, uh, in general, I would say, the, the Venn diagram of those who push for shared prosperity as the alternative to an income inequality measure are the same people who would like to see this remain in Tier 3 forever, or at least to exclude multinational companies entirely from the scope, despite the fact that the entire political process that got this on the map in the SDGs, largely led by the African Union and the Economic uh, Commission for Africa, the high-level panel chaired by Tabo and Becky, um, was absolutely clear um, that multinational companies were very firmly uh, in, in their scope. This attempt to unpick it, um, because of course multinationals come from other countries by and large, is ongoing, but I think being currently at least resisted quite well. The challenge though is to get decent um, uh, indicators in there. We have slightly unfortunately a target that says we have to reduce the dollar scale of illicit flows, and nobody has a good measure of the dollar scale of illicit flows, hence the risk of it stays in, um, in tier three. These are the proposals, however, that we have put forward and that UNCTAD and the regional UN Economic Commissions are now taking forward in national pilots. That doesn't mean that they will go to the Statistical Commission in a year and a half or two to be signed off, but there is a decent chance if this pushback can be resisted. And these two indicators are really the A and the C of, of the ABC. Um, one on profit, uh, shifting or misalignment, um, simply a measure using country by country reporting multinationals on the size of the gap between where economic activity takes place and where profits are declared. Now that's going to capture some legitimate misalignment, but the greatest part, of course, you know, think of those bubbles of Luxembourg and the Netherlands and so on, is very deliberate profit shifting. The advantage of this is that it gives you not just one global measure in dollar terms, but also national accountability. It will tell you what the picture looks like in Ghana, for example, if Ghanaian citizens want to look to their government and ask, are you doing what you can do? Or in the UK. But it'll also tell you what things look like in Luxembourg and tell the rest of the world how Luxembourg looks in a way that we haven't had consistent data on yet. So the potential for accountability of authorities at home, but also international accountability of profit-shifting jurisdictions is, is built into that uh, indicator. In a similar way, um, taking aggregate global data on the difference between uh, assets held according to financial institutions in each jurisdiction and assets declared to tax authorities in home countries will give you both a global measure of undeclared offshore assets but also national accountability, both for jurisdictions that are hiding assets of others and for jurisdictions where the tax authorities may simply be deciding not to go after their own elites because let's face it, tax is, is political, ultimately rather than technical. Putting this information in the public domain doesn't fix everyone's governance, but it has uh, the potential at least to take away a lot of the obstacles to sovereignty that allow a process at the national level of reclaiming ownership of the right to tax, retaking tax sovereignty. And that, it seems to me, is you know, potentially one of the biggest things the SDGs could do. And so, I would like to enroll you in supporting this, in working on these things, in uh, pushing back um, on the attempts to keep multinationals out of this, but also being very clear that the role of multinationals is a fundamental development issue. There is now a UN treaty potentially going through, at least being negotiated, that would bind transnational corporations in their language to put their country by country reporting data into the public domain, giving us the tools to do this whether or not it becomes part of the SDGs framework. So there's opportunities here to create the kind of data that is boring and technical and changes politics, and we should do it. So, I will shut up.
Dorcas uh, Erskine. Uh, Dorcas, the floor is yours. I don't think you're going to use the PowerPoint, so... No, because I'm here for the politics. Um, so um, I'm the activist in the room as uh, Chris, an ex-colleague who snuck me in, <laughs> um, has asked me to really talk about the politics, and so has David as well. So yes, you've had days and days of analytic theory around what is wrong, how depressing the world is around inequalities, how um, there is um, this proven uh, vast conspiracy to frame the narrative in a particular way. And that is all very true, but that is not very useful um, for the people we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether they be trade unions, whether they be women's groups and movements. This is their living reality. So what do we do as um, NGOs who work in um, this sector, who are not always, as a group, as progressive as we should be, we're not as accountable as we should be, we are also part of this paradigm in many ways as well. So what do we do about that? And to plug ActionAid um, a little bit, um, and to take a little bit of credit from the Tax Justice Network, just a little bit, but um, ActionAid has always been the kind of um, NGO that is known as a disruptor. We say difficult things um, and we try and change the debate. So many years ago when we were doing all the work on make poverty history and you saw the whole mobilization of civil society in the UK around uh, development and the MDGs, we started to have a conversation that said, well, um, development isn't just about aid, and uh, aid is a blunt tool of redistribution that start talking about tax and inequalities. And at the time, it wasn't seen as the dumb thing to do, um, because the only value in politics, after all, is expediency. And um, tax wasn't expedient at the time in our sector. Now, I think we're looking about 12 years later and organizations that are a little bit more conservative than us, such as Save the Children, are talking about tax. Um, organizations that are more powerful than us, such as Oxfam, have taken on the inequality agenda. So we start disruptive conversations. So let me start another disruptive conversation, because in all of that that we're all very happy about is that there has been this... Um, in our sector, and it probably shows where I, I sit in the sector and my own specialism, but there's always been this thing about forgetting about the women, um, you know, or adding the women to the take, you know, in the same sort of way that we're sort of criticizing a certain discourse on shared prosperity, that there'll be this trickle-down effect. It's almost the same in my own sector that if you, you know, really work on inequality in the way we're framing it at the moment as a sector, then suddenly all the women will be okay. Bollocks. So um, what, one of the key things in terms of what we're trying to do in um, the debate is bringing the issue of women and inequality to the fore. So we're talking about issues such as the unpaid care, the care economy and how, that, and how governments prosper on that. Um, we have, um, and when we started talking about it five years ago, or even longer, by a very good colleague of um, Chris sitting over there, Rachel Mazier, when she used to go to the IMF or even to other um, NGOs um, to talk about uh, women's unpaid care and how that means they can't um, participate in the workplace, we were sort of laughed out of town. But now we have um, an experiment which is funded by the Dutch government in about five different countries where women are doing time use surveys, talking to their um, governments and showing how much they contribute to the economy and to the lack of social protection through their unpaid care. We also are starting a disruptor conversation around gender just industrial policies, you know, um, We've been talking to DFID as it started to create its economic development framework and policies. And they keep saying to us, you know, we want um, NGOs to go beyond the inclusion agenda. We want to be the people in the middle who are um, bringing inclusion and transformation, which I guess is code for the shared prosperity. So again, like how do you sprinkle women into this other thing? 
that is um, around private sector um, led development. Like, okay, no worries, we've got an answer for that. <laughs> so, you know, we've been working with um, the Bangladeshi governments and the Vietnamese governments around um, women's work, women's labor. Um, a lot of the um, developments in terms of um, driven by garment factories and manufacturing are on the backs of women's labor where um, they are not adequately compensated, they are not um, seen as um, um, key parts of the, the, the country's economic story, and their rights are trampled upon. And again, it's all like, okay, that's all we've heard, we know that. But then what we see in um, Bangladesh and in Vietnam, they're starting to do lots more on light manufacturing, there's a lot of growth there, but women are not included in that discourse. Um, and so we, we started to create a gender-just industrial policy. These are things that matter to the women's groups that we work with. They don't often make um, the wider conversation. Maybe the things that make the wider conversation or the academic discourse is how do you do gender budgeting? How do you make sure that they're gender-responsive public services? Rather than women as pure, active economic agents um, within their societies which also means that you have to look at something that's also not very comfortable for economists, which is violence. So we are trying as an organization to bring the intersection between inequality, women's economic empowerment, and violence. You, these are massive barriers to women and girls participating um, in economies around the world, and we're tired of them being shafted into the women's movement space or into um, really ridiculous um, voyeuristic campaigns on endless kind of practice of that practice. These are real solid barriers to women's political and economic um, participation in their societies, and they don't make this discourse. Um, and that's really quite difficult. I mean, I was struggling when I got the instructions um, for, for this talk because I was like, well, there's a lot here about SDGs, a lot here about um, inequalities framed in um, a certain way. And that's not the language that most of the women that we work with use or understand. And it's, their realities are not reflected in this debate. So, I mean, you're very all very learned people here, you're activists, you're academics. We just want um, help, I think, as an NGO sector um, to bring these discourses to somewhere where they don't stay on the margins. Another big thing that we are very concerned about, again, I know this sounds very pedantic and very small, but again, this is how um, our tax work started. So one day, when uh, someone else is sitting here or standing here in a few years' time, it will be part of the discourse. But one of the things that's also missing in the inequality agenda um, that really impacts um, uh, women and girls disproportionately and young men is migration. The migration as a right um, um, and migration as a key element of development. And the key ways in um, which um, difficult or not progressive migration disproportionately affects certain women um, in the world. And that's not a discussion point. So whole societies um, that we're working in are losing um, their youngest, their fittest, to um, dangerous migration routes, and they are not um, permitted, as we know, in, um, in the UK and in Europe. Apparently, they have uh, settled a deal on migration. Be interested to see the details. But this is also not part of the, the discourse that you're having. I think what I'm trying to say in a really um, iterative fashion is these debates um, around uh, the SDGs, around the framing, around tax justice, we as a sector and as activists are wondering, have we left the movements that we're supporting behind? And um, that's been a very difficult question for us in ActionAid as we started our new international strategy. We are not a movement. I mean, we have to sit down and accept what we are. We are an INGO who gets a lot of money <laughs> to work in different, difficult contests, to work in countries where governments try and shut us down in terms of our civil society space. That's true, we have our problems. 
But we're part of a paradigm that's not really bringing the voices, I think, anymore to this agenda around inequality. And I tried, I tried for the, this is why it took so long to confirm my attendance. I tried to find ways in which I could frame what we are programming around, what the women's movements are saying, to the frame that you had for this conference. And I failed. And I'm not a stupid person. <laughs> I failed, and, uh, and I, I, that's the challenge um, I want to, to put to you. This debate has become so sterile and so removed from the activism that we're seeing, that I'm wondering if we're, as a community, still relevant. If we're still talking about what matters. So what we are trying to do in our humility is to reframe the complete discussion again. Is to step back and say, what is, how do we um, make this issue expedient in the way that it means to women and girls around the world and still has political capital? And in actually, it's a federation, so there are divisions. Some of the European um, um, affiliates um, want to do precisely, I think, what you were sort of conceptualizing in your, um, your instructions to me in terms of what um, I, I read. Now let's talk about um, shared inequalities around the world, within societies, whether you're in the North or in the South, um, you know, there are lots of people in the North who are um, suffering a lot, and it's true. But forgive me for being an African Ghanaian woman who says there's a hierarchy of need, and we are not all the same. And somehow in this immersion of this debate, there is a fear that we have, at least as um, ActionAid UK, that's supporting some of these um, movements on the ground that we are losing the visibility of those who are really most affected. So most of our campaigning will be around bringing that visibility. I'm not sure how um, the tactic has worked, um, and you can um, like challenge me or, or tell me otherwise, because you're on the outside and you know we sometimes don't really know the effectiveness. But how long, I mean, we all get very excited in our activist world as NGOs, when there's another inequality report from Oxfam, and then it's all over the newspapers to show the elites who have X, Y, Z, and those who don't. But if you are a normal member of the public, and we do campaigning, and you know, how long do you have to do those reports where it, it hits a saturation point, that those stories don't matter anymore, those figures like fade into insignificance? And that's a luxury that we can't afford. We need to keep um, a lot of um, our supporter base in the UK, as well as the supporter base in the countries we work in, motivated. And uh, it might be controversial to say, but these things don't mean anything anymore to our supporter bases. So what's the next level of activism? The next level of activism for me is to have sovereign-led activism and sovereign voices around what, where, for me, and you can challenge me and I accept your challenge, the true inequalities lie. And I would ask you to, um, to really reflect on that um, as we, we go on. But that's all I wanted to do here. I just wanted to throw a small grenade into um, the, the discussion and be um, slightly um, less academic or be stubborn and not talk in your frame. Um, and then ask you to um, not give up hope because um, I feel as uh, INGOs and NGOs structurally and this whole thing, we are becoming redundant in the debates. I admit that. But what, uh, what I, um, I'm very happy about is seeing all of these movements of people and wherever they are, lie and wherever they are politics, who are challenging us and taking that to the fore. So we are learning to sit down, be humble, and be the facilitator of those discussions. We just need academics like you to join up the dots and push it forward. Thank you for your time. Okay, I think those um, three sets of comments and presentations give us quite an agenda uh, to fit into the next um, 30, 40 uh, minutes. Um, 
So Kiko started us off looking at, in a way, the great breakthrough of having a, an SDG on inequality, but the disappointment of having weak targets and weak indicators. So, I mean, interestingly, she did point out to the way, certainly, that I think academic researchers, DSA members, had been involved. Part of that lobby of the 90 uh, folks writing was actually a, a, a group of DSA members along with, uh, with, uh, with others um, on that issue. Um, with Alex, we moved into global inequalities, and I think Alex identified possible ways that uh, academics might be useful, certainly in the creation of better data sets that will actually allow um, arguments to be made more forcefully about what's, uh, what's happening. And um, I don't know, I have to admit, uh, that I, it, it, when I looked at all the papers that we were having at DSA this time uh, as other times, as an association, we're very good about talking how to spend it better, but we usually have relatively little to say about how to raise more revenue. We, we do tend to focus on investing in health and education, but not on how to get even more revenue through domestically so that it could be, uh, could be uh, transferred, so we could think of that. And, and then to complete the Dorcas threw in um, a small grenade. I didn't know they came in different sizes, but obviously... Um, <laughs> um, but, was certainly finding that the sort of way that we were framing inequality, the materials that we provided her with, with what we were doing here were not fitting into any disruptive course of action that might be of use to uh, to activist groups, to those who are trying to uh, to work on the, the edge. And she uh, certainly proposed what Southern-led activism and Southern voices. And uh, again, you know, we've made some progress maybe in the last few years with getting more uh, Southern voices and uh, links with Southern uh, academics and researchers, but we've still got a long way to go. Okay, um, have we got, I think we've got one or two folks who are gonna take the, uh, the, 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 uh, the microphones around. Should we start with this side, if there's anybody on, oh. Okay. We're we'll trying to do it so it doesn't take too long. Anybody on this side, if you put your hand up, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, very focused. Uh, got one there, anybody else? and sound. Okay, those three. One, two, three. Yep. Hi. Uh, this is very much for Alex. It's on tax. Um, tax Justice Network, one of my favourite organisations, but I do see them as largely reactive. <laughs> they look at the injustice of the existing taxation system. And I'm just wondering, Alex, if you're thinking of going proactive and looking at what a what a a just tax system might look like, especially with respect to taxation on our colonies. Okay, and if we move along the front um, here, <coughs> yourselves as you make your comment or ask your question. Thanks, I'm Hinky GDI. Um, question on tax, I think the Dorcas and Alex. Um, a lot of the, um, I think you've missed, uh, well it's not missed an hour, but I think state building is the other big outcome of, of tax and revenue uh, historically, but the question is, is about the politics of taxation, which you covered the global aspects, but could you, both or either of you comment on the national aspects, that's where the real struggle is to get uh, governments able to drive up more domestic revenue. At the moment, I've been looking at this a little bit in countries like Uganda, um, the current tax parking relationship is based on collusive state business relations around exemptions, a high degree of lack of trust because citizens aren't seeing the outcome in terms of service delivery, and um, populist promises around handouts, a sort of a, a vicious cycle of state society relations. Any insights on how to turn that one around would be, a, would be very useful for people working on that uh, towards a more sort of virtuous social contract type uh, relationship. Okay, well, we'll you have a response to those, Alex. A couple of them. <coughs> uh, well, as I'm largely reactive, um, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm guessing Paul, that the answer to the question is we should support universal basic income. Um, <laughs> and you know, broadly uh, in favour of that. But I, actually, I don't think uh, 
the reactor is, is fair. You know, it is true that there are reacting to what I think is one of the, the biggest problems of the quality. But you know, the proposals that, that we put on the table that have gone from you know wild uh, staring eye lunacy to you know, by 2013 the agenda of the G20 and the OECD and so on. You know, I think that's, that's you know, we, we get a tick in the proposition box for that. Right? On the other hand, um, uh, you know, A, I'm professionally required never to be happy with where we are, um, and B, you know, there's still so much to do. Right? The global movement um, for tax justice is strengthening um, in country after country, and, and the connection between the kind of the technical discussion and the mass mobilisation is building with that. But we have a long way to go, um, and the almost complete absence of tax justice issues from paper and conferences like this is just one indicator of things that worry me. Um, but it can't all come from the very small number of people who are the tax justice network. You know, this requires the collaboration of organisations, it requires greater engagement of academics from different disciplines that we've always had, but in limited numbers. Um, so, you know, no pressure, but I'm coming back next year. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, you're the, the second person in, in a week to <laughs> suggest to me that Uganda is sort of a, a, a counterpoint. Um, the Uganda Revenue Authority, for what it's worth, has done some absolutely world leading work in the last two years with colleagues at the ICTV um, on taxing high net worth individuals. And they've done that in this ridiculously constrained political environment. I think that's the kind of thing you can do, but tax doesn't fix it on its own. And nor does transparency. You don't you know, put numbers out there and suddenly governments that were previously colluding with their elites and were interested in broad based development say, oh, you've done it wrong. You should have said it. Now we'll change. You know, it, it, there's a process, and it's in the same way that there are no um, silver bullets in other areas. Tax isn't one either. But it is true, I think, that the interventions that are possible in terms of fixing global weaknesses provide the basis for national processes to be much more positive. And that doesn't mean they all will be. It's you know, we're talking averages. In the same way that a country that you know tomorrow doubles its direct uh, tax to GDP won't the year after have better governance um, automatically. These are average long-term processes. But given that we have so few things that are associated with improvements in governance, and tax is one of them, and we know there are international levers that can raise the bar for everyone, we'd be silly not to use them, or rather to keep not using them. So it's not the answer. So, I mean, it wasn't really a criticism of you in particular as a, a group. I mean, we're all in it, and there is only one answer for it. And again, it's another grenade, sorry. It's called patriarchy, right? Women's issues are those side issues. You know, they're not the discourse of um, strong macroeconomic um, policy. It's, it's just a practice, and I mean, I hold up my hand for like participating in it until some people told me to check myself, which I'm still doing, I'm finding difficult. Um, so it's, it, that's just the, the, there isn't um, any like complicated like um, explanation behind it. Women's issues, just that, are women's issues, you know, unpaid care work, you find all of, when you go to the IMF, you know, they, it's, it's great to see it entering the discourse. When you go to the World Bank, you see that, you know, everyone sits at a nice table, Christine Lagarde, everyone's wearing fantastic shoes and talking about, like, you know, the intersections between women's unpaid care. But when it gets to the room, right, where real decisions are being made or when there are research grants given out on certain topics, it doesn't kind of make like the top 10, does it really, you know? It's because people like us make it expedient and that's our job, you know, our job is to make it expedient. It was a way of like gently asking you to join us in the battle if you want to know how to address that, to take interest in the fact that over half of the population 
is not really represented in your work. That's kind of damning, but it's damning for all of us. And it's because we live in a system where that's not the case. But I don't want to be depressing about it. The fact that in these spaces that we're even talking about it in the IMF, in the World Bank, that there are papers, that there's donor money for um, the experiments that we are doing in certain countries with women's groups, it's amazing. Things are not that bleak, but they could be much better. Okay, can we give the people in this central arm? We've got a colleague in the at the back, uh, and a colleague just below him, our colleague here in the middle, and our colleague there. We've got the four, okay? And Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to follow on from Sam's <coughs> question. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sorry, Gareth Hall from the uh, uh, International Development Department at the University of Birmingham. Um, just following on from Sam's question, is there no local uh, processes or act activities here? So I'm particularly thinking about fiscal devolution or you know, the, the roles of cities, the roles of the, the local, particularly with working with local groups or whether it's women or any uh, marginalised centre. It always seems to be national processes when we're talking about the global framework, but I, I'm not heard at all when we're about local. Uh, yeah, Patrick Kilby from the Australian National Uni. <clears throat> um, my question is to Dawkins. Now, I must preface this. The question is about NGOs, but I must preface it by saying I've been with Oxfam Australia for 30 years, including a student on the board. So, my question is about ethics and action. Going back to Oxfam, Oxfam Great Britain, that's affected everybody, has just had a massive hand grenade thrown into its space around ethics and action. You know, what are ethics and how does that map with what we're saying? And on a much gentler one scale, I saw an action aid advertisement the other night and it sort of perpetuated the patriarchy and really portrayed women in not a particularly empowering light. And so my question is the ethics and action and how is that managed, dealt with, confronted, engaged with, whatever? Uh, my name is Madeline Spiri. Uh, two, uh, my question is, I'm from South Africa, by the way, so I'm based there. There's, uh, um, to Sekido and, and Thomas, uh, in terms of uh, the things that you spoke about, about political power, so power is nice. Uh, I think everybody knows that. And uh, what we should actually, uh, I just want to ask, to say, what counter hegemonic projects are there? To ask uh, whether to give up patriarchy or to give up the hegemonic projects that maintain the SDGs. Um, in, in a sense that uh, those privileges should not be there. Uh, I'm Haider Khan uh, from University of Denver, uh, Colorado, USA. Um, I have uh, probably uh, a question that can be addressed to both Sakiko and Alex uh, as an academic activist, and I have another question to Dawkins, which is purely as an activist. Uh, and <laughs> uh, the question uh, about academic uh, uh, activist is that uh, uh, technical issues and political practical issues are intertwined, as both the talks demonstrated. Now, concretely, uh, what can people like me, who are both technocrats and activists, uh, uh, um, uh, do uh, to help you know, uh, further the agenda that I think we share um, in each case? Uh, so I'd like you to respond to that. And just quickly, uh, for Sakiko in particular, you know, I was one of those people at Asian Development Bank. Um, uh, I was advising Mitsuo Sato, the then uh, president, uh, uh, who um, uh, proposed that instead of making this poverty reduction the only goal for the IFIs uh, the, in 1999, that we should explicitly include inequality reduction. Uh, but of course, that went nowhere. And uh, for, for our um, uh, third speaker, uh, it's so, so interesting and, and moving, really, 
uh, to hear what you have to say. And, and you recognize the problem, I think, you know why the gap exists. Uh, and it's not just a problem of women, though in particularly uh, garment sectors and, and other women, not uh, 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 largely women, dominated uh, sectors where women are largely exploited. Uh, this is certainly the case, and patriarchy is the larger problem. But I know from my own experience as an activist, I fought in the liberation war in Bangladesh, uh, and uh, uh, we fought for a just, uh, non-exploitative society, which has not been realized. Uh, but I know even today, there are people who are activists on the ground, so why can you not connect with them, or how can you rather connect with them better? Uh, not, yeah. on the, well, I mean, I think on the, 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 the whole idea of um, academics and activism, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in the importance of policy activism. And I'm a firm believer, I mean, the more I watch uh, changes in the international development related policies, I think that if it weren't for civil society activism, uh, you would have much, much worse policies. And I think um, uh, I have been following uh, the, the, the whole issue of um, uh, access to medicines and issues of pharmaceuticals and rising prices of medicines. And you know that's the area in which I'm currently working in terms of uh, policy, policy issues. And when you look at that, um, I think the role of policy activism and the need for technical expertise that in part draws on, on academic research is tremendously important. And, and I've watched how issues of intellectual property uh, have moved from, I mean, there's, there's been tremendous progress, you know, in, in 2000, uh, it used to cost $20,000 a year to have a course of treatment with uh, antiretrovirals, right? And today it is $100 or less. And why is that? That is because of the activism, research-based academic uh, supported activism that, that actually uh, made alliances with uh, certain national governments and that changed rules in uh, WTO that, that mobilized companies to give discounts, that mobilized, that's still struggling, certainly not enough. I mean, not, none of what's happened is, is enough at all. But this continues because of activism. And I've also seen in my own country where the absence of that kind of activism has allowed uh, changes, adoption of trade agreements and so forth that are going to make a whole lot of uh, things worse. So, I mean, I, I, I do think that there is a critical role for um, policy-oriented, academic, research-based uh, activism that brings uh, economic expertise and other kinds of expert expertise into uh, these policy debates. There were a lot here, weren't there? Okay, so let's take the uh, ethics one um, uh, first. It, it's true, I mean, I, I think what the Oxfam scandal, as the, um, the short word um, term has become in our sector, was um, good at revealing and difficult to take is that we are not immune. The, um, you know, we, um, our only credibility is the fact that we talk in moral language. It doesn't always mean that we are moral. Um, and that's been a, a difficult thing um, to take as a sector, because we're very good at criticizing others, and it's hard to, to take it um, when, it, when it's um, take it, um, given to you. But that's, that's the reality of it. If you're a woman who works in my sector, those sort of stories, and there is a whole mobilization of women who've been publishing um, things anonymously and openly in the media since um, the scandal broke. It's no different in some cases than working in other sectors that other women are working in. Um, 
the fact of the matter is we are not immune to that. I'm glad um, that it's happened. I'm sad at the cost of what's happened, but I think it's necessary to make us stronger and better as a sector. And to the specific point about the Action Aid ad, I agree with you. There are things that we also get wrong. I mean, when you are also um, given my specialism in the organization, these are live debates we have. As I, I started the conversation, I said, the only value in politics is expediency. The only way we, we have to cut through the noise and try and make our issues expedient. And it's always a balance between how we do that and how we do that with dignity. And we failed a few times and we've had like some complaints around those ads and we've taken them on board and things have changed. But it's, we are, I guess like what I'm trying to say is that we are no better than um, anyone else really. And so we have to be held accountable for that. There isn't any sort of wiggly answer around it I mean, I could, I have like um, a, a statement prepared for exactly these questions uh, anytime they come from. But I don't think that's necessary. The fact of the matter is, we are groups of people who have come together because we believe um, that the world could be and should be different. And in that, we come with many different kinds of motivations and behaviors. And when they fall short, yeah. We get called out on it, and we have to have systems and processes that make sure that we don't abuse others. But that's not always going to be the case, that we won't abuse others. It's just that let's not pretend that we're any better than others, that we're not part of a patriarchal system as well. And that it's women in our sector who are also holding the men accountable, because that's just the reality. You have to also name where the problem is. And I think that's also what we haven't done very well as well. There is a, a lot of men who have a lot of power in our sector, and they are now being held accountable. Hallelujah. Okay, um, so then, um, then let me um, see. Around the local processes, around why don't you talk to um, activists, I think the, as I say, we're not a perfect um, INGO, but um, I think one good thing that can be said about Action Aid, we were the first to internationalize our headquarters is in South Africa. We don't do development in the way that um, is like traditionally conceived. It goes through all the, the local partners. I think one of the things that was most ironic at a meeting that we had very recently in New York around localization, again, this disruptor brand, you know, um, as we call it, that in the humanitarian sector, there's the sexy term around doing more localization, being more accountable to local populations. It's something that we started talking about ages ago when people still wanted to drop in countries and then rescue people. Um, and so we were like, okay, if the UN says they want to do this and they're holding a conference about this, let's bring like these local women's organizations who be responding to emergencies. So we brought her to the conference, we were in this posh plenary, and they struck her comments from the record because she wasn't a registered member of where the, you know, the, you can't make it up around like the irony of, of this stuff. So that's what we were, my short answer is we have been doing it. We are not the only ones who were, were doing it. We were one of the early ones, but everyone, you know, I think it's also important to acknowledge what we do. We are getting right as an INGO sector. I mean, some of the analysis or criticism that sometimes held up at us is almost 30 years old, you know. Most um, INGOs work through local groups. Could they do much better around like resource transfer and redistribution? You bet you they could, you know. Could we do better around our own transactional costs? Yes. But that is the norm, um, rather than the exception, though I just want to put it on record that we were one of the first. Yeah? Okay, thank you very much. And then what is the counter um, narrative? The counter narrative has already started. You know, it's not, um, it's what I'm trying to say. Maybe I didn't say it um, very well or fluidly, but I was trying to say that um, these women's groups or these youth groups or whoever, or trade unions, they're not actually waiting for us or our policy-based answers to mobilize and create that alternative. They are. I guess my concern with some of um, the activism that's happening around inequality is that it's at risk of getting quite violent because um, there isn't um, a, a pathway to us 
you know, we're, whether we like to see ourselves that way or not, we're sort of the middle people in that conversation. And my challenge was, which is a challenge to me as well, and my sector, and my organization, are we be doing enough in terms of like um, talking in terms of their language and translating it in languages that those who hold the power are able to process and then make action with. But I, th I don't think we are the ones who are creating the counter narrative that's already being created. It's just not articulated by us as well as it could be. Okay, we'll take three last questions from the, the, the far side and then we'll come back and, and get a final comment. Anybody want to ask a question or make a point on the, the left wing? <laughs> <laughs> Our colleague down here then, okay, that will get us a little bit longer to make final points. Thanks to the speakers for their presentations. That, my name is Dan Brockett from Sid at Sheffield. I'd like to bring out the tension I heard in, in the last two speakers because I think Alex, you said there are opportunities to create the kind of thing which are boring and technical, but which change politics. And Dorcas, you said that um, debates about inequality seem to have become sterile and far removed from the passions and realities of, of people's lives. So I think you were in disagreement with each other. And I wondered, Alex, if, if you could explain how you might um, make this boring technical data <coughs> more passionate, more relevant to people's lives. And Dorcas, how um, you could encourage, or whether you would want to encourage your, your partners become more excited about tax. <laughs> I should say, our Alex, he's our board member, so, you know, he sits on our board. We actually agree on more than, um, as, and our, our, our activists are really excited about tax, as um, Christmas as well. They, they really are. Um, so I don't really want to make this false dichotomy because it doesn't exist. Um, and I, as um, you know, as has been said before, policy activism is really important. That's not the point I was making. I wasn't saying that um, you know policy activism is redundant. No, I was saying that the issues that we are dealing with with women's groups are not in this debate. Um, and I feel that is that is a fact that needs to be addressed. But I, I don't really um, think that um, the activists that we work with are not interested in tax. The women are interested in tax. When we do budget um, monitoring in their communities, they're like, eh, so that's where it's going, and that's why we don't have this. They are very, very interested in tax. <laughs> um, but um, tax specialists are not interested in women, and that's where I am talking about. <laughs> I'm going to be largely reactive again. <laughs> in December last year, um, we, along with a great many other groups, uh, including most of the major women's rights organisations around the world, launched the Bogota Declaration on Tax Justice and Women's Rights, which now has more than 150 signatories. The point of that wasn't to say anything that anyone didn't know, it was to get everyone aligned on what they already know they share in common. Those two groups working together to a common agenda. And so it, it is something that has been moving. It's probably the most exciting piece of the tax justice ecosystem at the minute because of how much um, power there is uh, in that space. But it goes back to um, uh, the point that Gareth raised. So you know, where is the local in this? If the tax justice network wanders around the world talking about tax havens, you know we can have fascinating conversations in Washington um, and a few other places, Paris. But that's kind of it. If we talk to people who are working on tax justice in their local contexts, they're interested in that to an extent, but they'd much rather talk about the fact that they're paying more tax than their member of parliament, or that the companies that are employing people aren't employing them very well and are paying less tax than the uh, hamburger man that serves them in, in action in his memorable study of Sad Miller. And it's questions around local tax incentives, for example, much more than international profit shifting that engage people and where I think we have historically failed to make those connections. But I would say, you know, we as an organization are 15 years old. The broad movement is in some ways more like 10 years old in terms of a global presence of regional networks, and those links are stronger every year, and the connection between the policy work that's happening and the mobilization is closer every year. As um, Dorcas has said, we are 
and equally imperfect. Um, but we're all trying to do that in different difference. And so I think you know Dan, that gap is there, but it's it's a gap everyone is aware of and fighting against, rather than perhaps at some point we might not have been aware of it, or we have been aware of it, but didn't think it mattered. And that's really not the case. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just at the risk of repetition, I think that my point really was not about, you know, bad measurement in a te technical sense at all, but about the problem of the far-reaching effects that this choice of measure has on the, the, the discourse and the agenda, and that we really uh, can't allow the, the, the inequality agenda just to be a poverty issue. It is about the concentration of wealth and issues like the tax and injustice. So, thank you very much. Okay, um, I, I, actually, uh, a, 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 a moment of clarity, I can see five or six things that I think we could take forward and I'll, 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 I'll maybe try to summarize with the, I mean, the first thing I'd say, I mean, some of the presentations we've had there earlier on uh, could lead one to despair, but certainly I, I hope the message that's come out here is be extremely dissatisfied, be annoyed with the world, don't be angry with it, because that's certainly what many populist politicians are, are doing, um, but don't despair, but do take action. Um, we've heard, uh, I mean, particularly uh, with Sakiko, but with uh, other things that have happened at the conference, about the space for policy activism, particularly for lobbying, and certainly the example of those academics and researchers who are engaged in proposing uh, inequality in 2012-13. Um, for those of you who are younger than me, then 2027-28, put it in your diary. You can try and get really effective measures of inequality put into the 2045 uh, agenda. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I'm not joking, because I, I think the SDGs now have got a momentum. They are a UN process. Every 15 years, there'll be a chance to, to push data forward, and, uh, and that really needs to be, um, to be taken on. Um, there's also the possibility of data sets, and I think the sort of data that... Alex is using that's great, but it's a pity we didn't make it available 10 or 20 years earlier so that this, uh, that, uh, that this could have happened. So there's data sets. I mean, Oxfam has its inequality reports, but whether whether we could also think or somebody could think about the sorts of measures which Chiquito thought would be more progressive measures, whether somebody could systematically start producing those on an annual basis outside the UN when... When, 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 when the statistics that don't satisfy us um, are, are published. Um, that's certainly one thing. A second thing that I'd say about this policy activism, and it hasn't come up here, but it's something that really continues to worry me deeply about my own work and, and many other people's, is the way that yeah, we, we can do this for policy activism, but we're just not connecting with public understanding. I mean, all of us in this room, for around about 40 to 45 percent of the British population, would be seen as elite whingers, not concerned about their interests, not concerned about the problems they face. And somehow, I do think we've got, a, well, got to find some sort of mechanism of thinking about how we enhance public understanding of, of what we do as, a, as an association and, uh, 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 and these things. The case for tax was made, and I, I would certainly say, because I've looked at so many DSA conferences over the years, that we still continue to neglect tax. Did anybody go for a GCRF tax of 20 million pounds? Somebody surely must have gone for it. If not, then you need to ask for one next time round and certainly come to the DSA membership to see if you can persuade some of us to stop, well, to continue looking at spending, but maybe to look at where the money could come from uh, 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 d domestically uh, uh, on that. And then uh, um, finally, um, it, it, it's been said several times at the conference, and uh, I, I, we've it's sort of mention of it uh, this afternoon, but we, uh, I think the DSA as an association does have to think about inequality and research opportunities in a way that it's certainly more than voices that are likely to get the grants, get the publications, get uh, the profile, and uh, yeah, we know that is, is not for, we know that is unjust, we know that is not a contribution <laughs> to making a more equal world, and so we really uh, need to work to uh, assist colleagues who are based in the South and also, as we come out of that, to, to ensure that we make progress uh, in terms of ensuring that we have uh, women involved in the research and taking forward um, these arguments. Can I thank all of you for lasting in till 3.15 to, the, uh, to this uh, final event today. Uh, I'm not sure whether Ro has... Is there anybody to say any final words? 
Or I get the final word. <laughs> Sarah, do you <coughs> I, okay, on behalf of Sarah then, um, uh, I, 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 I will thank you very much for coming, thank you for, for ha hanging in uh, with us today and we look forward to working with you over the coming year and seeing you at the Open University uh, next year. Thank you very much.